firstly, why their policy is absolutely unnecessary. Unnecessary. Secondly, why exactly we do much better in terms of diversity. And thirdly, how we think their policy results in newspapers basically panning to the government and why we think that's bad. But before that, a few points of rebuttals. Firstly, she talked about how newspapers are going to cut corners and why this is really, really bad because they're going to fire the poor correspondent who lives in China. We don't think that's going to happen. We don't think that has ever happened because these news outlets recognize that at the end of the day, they're a news agency and the last thing that they want to do is undermine the quality of the news by firing the only person they have in that particular region who can provide first-hand account of exactly what's happening in those regions. Secondly, if a problem is really about them you know, cross-checking with other sources as she doesn't think that's really, really good, but that happens when it comes to news institutions anyway. Sometimes they can't get access to certain forms of news and they rely on Reuters, for example, to get a particular perspective. We don't think that's necessarily a bad, bad thing. But more to the point, the way they go about doing things is that you don't cut down the things that they have right now. Rather, what they try to do is try and innovate as much as possible to try and capture back that market share again. That's why we see New York Times allowing Nate Point Silver, his so. own segment, to try and criticize things like the electoral processes in the United States of America because they recognize that could potentially get more eyeballs to the New York Times considering it's something that's new in a niche area that nobody else is covering. We think this trend of innovation and market brand building for example, Why in Slate, where Matt Iglesias tries to establish a cult following with the kind of articles or opinion editorials that he puts on Slate. And we think these kind of innovations uh, get point to the back. Next, we object to the characterization that blogs are just, you know, people ranting about life. Like maybe a whole news personal life journal might be like that. <laughs> or we think when our authors like Andrew Sullivan report on news, we think the quality of the opinion editorials are either, I, I personally think they're better than Paul Koopman's on, like, on the New York Times. But it can rival the kind of opinion ed editorials that you see in established major news institutions as well. We don't think it's a problem. Now that we're done with their case, the three parts are substantive. My second and my third Sir? substantive point will deal with the arguments about diversity and neutrality correspondingly. So on my first argument substantive, we are aware of the ineluctable realities of why people are moving away from traditional news institutions. One, we recognize that people have a taste for the sensational. That's why they're opting for the editorial lines of the sun and things of that sort. Secondly, we recognize as well, they're moving away because they recognize they can possibly get the same things for free online through things like the Huffington Post or through things like Andrew Sullivan's blog as well. And thirdly, we recognize another problem when it comes to news institutions. Because things like employing people like Robert Fisk to engage in investigative journalism does cost a lot of money. And the way they try to cover up for that will be through covering their costs for editorials. But unfortunately, with things like Craigslist and everything of that sort, they can bypass news institutions to get their own message across. And these are major loss leaders. Despite that onslaught, however, we see in society today the ability of newspapers to cope with these new developments and Sir. still be able to survive through their innovative pricing mechanisms or paywalls. We see uh, news institutions like The Economist and New York Times being able to survive right, through their whole provision of 23 opinion editorials and after a certain point you have to pay the amount of money. And the reason for that will be two reasons, right? Firstly, people recognize that at the end of the day, there is an inherent value in you opting for the New York Times for certain perspectives that they know is unique only to the New York Times. I call this the iTunes phenomena. That even though they might not be willing to pay top dollar for a particular news, uh, newspaper or broadsheet in society, the moment you allow for a compromise where you lower the cost What's and maybe given some freebies as well, and they recognize the inherent value of their newspaper, they're willing to engage on the compromise and go and pursue that particular outlet. And secondly, something I've elaborated earlier as well. The most of these newspapers are undergoing innovation to try to crack the market share to get people through in and get as many eyeballs as they want. So we don't think it's as necessary as they think it out to be. Point However, to assuming that at the point it still does not work, then this can only suggest that these newspapers are not doing enough to try and cope with that onslaught. And we think any policy on that side of the house is only going to be unsustainable at the end of the day because you can't do nothing to support these people in perpetuity. But more than to the point, we think it's not really that helpful anyway, right? Like, we think there are alternative sources that exist on the internet that can exist in view of these major institutions. For example, in The Atlantic, we think Jamie Stellos writes a mean coverage of China, which we think can also rival the major institutions as well. Meaning that you can always get the same quality news online anyway, despite not having these major institutions exist right now. Secondly, and I love this argument, we think we do much better for diversity. We need to understand one thing. Traditional news institutions unfortunately determine the tenor of dialectical discourse in society. For example, in the United States of America, the presence of these news institutions determine that the, the discourse that goes on in the United States is largely center-right. That's why we don't see people like Noam Chomsky being 
given any chance for any kind of uh, opinion editorial on any of the major newspapers in the United States of America because he's effectively been frozen out from the spectrum of discourse that the traditional newspapers deem to be acceptable in the society. We think that with the, the allowing these newspapers to fail or to decrease in significance, which is the probability that's going to happen considering that some of them are still going to survive, is very good for us because what we do is that we reject the ability to set the parameters of discussion in these societies with the ascension of like a plethora of different viewpoints view what they are able to sell their own viewpoints in spite of whatever the major institutions think. Mean, so what then happens here is that it's not limited to just center right tenor for the United States, but we break those parameters and we allow for greater diversity because not everybody has an opinion on what exactly ought to be the way. Do you have a POI? Right. Okay. So what else? The third substantive point that we have. Why exactly does this allow for the pandering to the government? See the problem with her, she recognized that lots of counties in the United Kingdom and lots of people, less, lots of people, uh, well, I see a grapple. There's lots of people. <laughs> and there's so many newspapers to choose, right? Basically, what happens is that you're allowing the government to pick their own winners. And why is this a problem? Because all the newspapers would then want to try and pander to the government as much as possible and temper down the criticism of the government and cease to become an effective.